بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبي وحبيب إله العالمين أبا القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المحسومين الذين ذاب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد قال الله العلي العظيم في كتاب كريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قد أفلح المؤمنون الذين هم في صلاة خاشعون والذين هم أن اللغو مؤرضون والذين هم للزكاة فائلون صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد The beginning tonight I would like to offer my well wishes and congratulations to the Imam of our time, Al Imam Sahib Al Asri Wa Zaman. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. For the birth anniversary of his father, Al Imam Al Hassan Al Askari, alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. And also offering my well wishes to the Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salam, in general. And to the Shia of Ahlul Bayt, especially the Shia of Ahlul Bayt in Baltimore, Imam Mahdi Center. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we all have the benefit of Shafa'a of Imam Al Hassan Al Askari on the day of Qiyamah, insha'Allah. And may Allah count us among the true followers of Imam Al Hassan Al Askari. Tonight, as we are going to celebrate the birth of this great Imam, I would like to connect with the, our topic that we started last week, which is the qualities of the true believers. Or in other words, a believer in the sight of Allah. Because there are believers who we normally claim to be, they come to ourselves, say, I'm a mu'min, I'm a believer. But we can say whatever we want to say, but not necessary, we meet the condition of mu'min in the sight of Allah. And the same way today, <clears throat> many of us, we call ourselves Shia, but not necessary that we meet the condition of being Shia. As many people at the time of Imam Ali and alayhi salam. They came to Imam Ali. Amir al-Mu'mineen. Why are you Shia? Imam Ali said, no, you're not. Say, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, we love you. We are followers of yours. Imam Ali said, no, you're not. Say, why not? I don't see the features of my Shia on you. Say, if I to Shia, it's not there on you. And then when you go and you read the book, it's called Sifar to Shia. Then you will know if you're really a Shia or not. But we call ourselves Shia. But the true, the true Shia is different than what we call ourselves. So in that line, we were trying to understand, when can I call myself a mu'min? When can I call somebody a mu'min? We mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it clear in Surah Al-Mu'minun as to if you want to count success, if you want to measure success, success cannot be measured with money. As today, that's how we measure success. 
Today, when you ask someone who is success, who do you think is success? You say the person who makes a lot of money. A person who possess a lot of things, own houses, car, business, you name it. It's called successful. But the Quran says, I don't count a person successful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Kada aflah al mu'minu. If you want to know a true successful person in the eyes of Allah, Allah said, they are the ones that are mu'minu. Ya Allah, who are the mu'minun? Last week we talked about the first quality. Alladheena hum. Those when they stand in front of Allah, you can see and sense the fear of Allah through their prayers. And we spoke about that in details. The next quality Allah talks about is The second quality, how you define a mu'min, mu'min don't waste time. His mind. In other words, a true mu'min value every second of their life. You know, one thing that we only take it granted is time. And even though you ask any average person, any human being you can think, ask them, how many times do you have in this life? They yeah, don't know. They even already don't know, but they always assume they have a long time. <coughs> That's why we plan 20 years from now. Even though I don't know, I might not even have tomorrow. We have a long plan. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you that a mu'min, a true mu'min, who takes advantage of every second of their life. Because we all are matter of time. From the day you are conceived, your time started ticking. How does it tick? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you and I, you are in your mother's womb for a certain period of time. After that time, you cannot stay there anymore. You have to come down. You have, you have to come out. It's a matter of time. Now, the moment you're born, your time started ticking too. How many years am I going to live on this planet? 50 years? 60 years? 100 years? Start ticking. When that time comes to an end, Allah said, let me tell you, لا يستقدمون ساعة ولا يستأخرون. We don't increase or decrease. We take it at the right time, at the time, at the right location, without adding or taking out of any minute. That's the term. Now, I enter in the life after death. It's time too. Until the time comes to an end, there is something called Yawmul Qiyam. Everything is based on time in your life. That's why Allah says, the quality of a mu'min, he values his time. So what does he do? And how does he value his time? Allah says, They stay away from vain talk. In it, anything that doesn't benefit their life, Anything that doesn't add a value to their life, they always stay away from them. I'm sitting with a brother or sister or family. They started gossiping. Riva. See, I walk away. Because it's a waste of my time. I sit in a person with a person. And all they do is what? Talk trash. My time is value. I know to do something with my life better than that. A mu'min, anything that is vain talk, they would not spend their seconds into that. They always stay away from it. Even the Quran tells you, in Surah Al and in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Ibadul Rahman. In Surah Al Furqan, as He described them, He said, When somebody comes to waste their time, when they walk in, Somebody wants to waste their time for vain talk. They walk and they say salam. They keep going. They don't stop to entertain any unnecessary talk. Why? Because every second of your life, you will be questioned about it. Every minute of my life that Allah gave me, 
They don't think that it's just free, I can do it. No, you have to be asked about it. How did you spend it? Where did you spend it? And you have to answer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To the word, The anything that is not beneficial. Time, not knowledge, not something that's going to add value to their life and time, they stay away from it. That's one tafsir. But there's another tafsir also. Says, Talks about music. In other words, they stay away from music. The music is one of the things that shaitan uses to distract people. That's why if you read the book of Imam Al-Khumayni, which is known as Arba'una Hadith, he talks about music and how it can affect your soul and your spiritual growth. Oh, by the way, but not, not all music. Because our scholars, they define haram music and halal music. The haram music that takes you away from Allah, misleads you, and leads you to do haram, that's absolutely haram. Allah, it says that this is one of the leaders of them. And what music are we talking about? A music that contains foul languages, where people talk bad things. Not only that, they are also used in amusement places, where it encourages others to do haram, to drink, to dance with different gender, or opposite gender, or lead to haram act. All of that is considered haram in Islam. But Islam is so beautiful. When Islam tells you that something is not halal, Islam tells you what is halal. Islam doesn't close a door unless it opens another door for you. When Islam said music is haram, or tells you nasheed is halal. Nasheed, Islamic song that is based on Islamic principles. It encourages you to do good, teach you akhlaq, mannerism. This is halal, Islam allows you to hear. As a matter of fact, when you go to Islam, it's history. When Rasulullah moved from Mecca to Medina, the people of Medina, they met Rasulullah with nasheed. al-badru alayna. When they started building the masjid in Nabawi, they were saying Nasheed too. Islam allows you to listen to Nasheed. But not music that is based on immorality. Some say, don't waste your time. Now, why is it that music is haram? Why, why if you ask someone, why music is haram? Now there's a perfect answer from Imam al Rada alayhi salam. A man came to him, Yabna Rasulillah. What is your opinion on music? Is it haram or halal? Imam said to him, Ya Abdullah, if everything in this world, everything is divided into two, everything is divided into two. And you are asked to put good thing on the right side and the bad thing on the left side. And you put line in the wrong side, salat on the right side, and you get to the music, where would you put it? He said, you have no Rasulullah, put it in the bad. He said, then that's your answer. Imam Rida Ali said, that's your answer. That music, which contains foul language, which we can see today in many of countries, where some of the music have led people to doing haram. That kind of music is haram in Islam. Because it kills morality of the person. And it kills akhlaq. So that is one of the quality of the mu'min. He values his time and doesn't use his time on vain talk. Unnecessary talk. Or doesn't listen to something that is not beneficial. When a mu'min sit to talk or to listen, either he is benefiting someone or he is benefiting from someone. A mu'min, your time have to be one of these two. 
اما مفيد او يستفيد i'm benefiting or i'm benefiting someone then your time becomes what beneficial to the second quality of a movement he or she does not waste their time on things that is vain that's number two number three Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِلزَّكَاةِ فَاعِلُونَ الزَّكَاةِ in Arabic means growth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, one of the quality of the mu'min, they always observe paying zakat. Zakat, what does it mean? You know, in Islam, we have Islamic tax. And Islamic tax is two kinds. One is wajib, one is mustahab. The wajib part is all divided into three. Number one, one of the Islamic tax that is wajib is known as khums. That is conditions where our maraj mentioned in, in top. That's one. The second one is called zakat. Zakat also is one of the wajibat. When a person meets the conditions, there are eight categories that a person has to spend zakat on. That is number two. Now, number three is Islamic tax which you made it wajib upon yourself, not Allah. And first, and the second one, Allah made it mandatory. Now, the third one, I can make it wajib upon myself. How? By making a vow to Allah, and when that vow takes place and happens, it becomes wajib. For example, to Ya Allah, I apply for a job. Ya Rabbi, if that job is accepted and I get the offer, Ya Allah, I will give zakat or sadaqa of hundred dollars. Now, if you don't get the job, it's not wajib. But the moment you get the job, then giving that amount is wajib. Now, as zakat here, not necessary al khums here when we talk about zakat, it's one of the wajibat Islam prescribed upon us. And in the Shia school of thought, zakat is more about Things like farms or animals. That is a details in fact. If a person is taking care of animals, such as cows, such as sheep, goat, camels, all right? Now, each one of them, when they reach a certain amount, and it's called had the nasab in fact. The amount that is required, now you have to give zakat out of those animals. But considering, there are other conditions too. Number one, provided that you don't buy food for them, they graze from Allah's blessing. You live in an area where there is all the grass they need and they graze as they want without you having to pay anything. Islam said there's zakat in it. Not only the animals, I have a farm. I grow dates, barley, corn. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, when the time of harvest come, you have to take care of the poor people. And because this is where Islam comes in the picture, brothers and sisters, that Islam is not about my relationship with Allah alone. Islam say your relationship with other human beings is also necessary. Islam is not only in the masjid, in center, salat, Quran, dua, ziyara. No. Taking care of the humanity is part of Islam. And that is why our Imam Ali alayhi salam, every night, he used to knock the door of all the needies in Kufa and making sure they have food, they have water, they have all necessities. Imam Zain al-Abdin was the same. When Imam Zain al-Abdin passed, his son, Muhammad al-Baqir alayhi salam, he saw a dark skin on the back of Imam because of how much he was carrying things to go take care of the poor people. And not only that, an imam used to do that, and he was doing this at night, and with the face covered except his eyes, so people don't recognize him. Until imam passed, that is when people realized and recognized, oh, that was the imam. And the same thing was Imam Ali and Ali Salaam. When he takes a food to the poor people, they will ask him, Masmuk, what's, what's your name? Who are you? He said, Ismi Abdullah. And that is one of the great things about Islam. That Islam says when you give something, Islam always prospers to do it in hiding. 
without publicizing it, without making it very public, keep it between you and the person. Allah sees it. Your reward is already written. You don't have to publicize it. One of the responsibilities of a, as a movement is to always take care of others. But now one important thing, brothers and sisters, when we say zakat, many times people think it's about money. I have to give money. I have to give animals. No, zakat is more than that. Um, some tafasir, they say, as zakat, every blessing Allah bless you with. When you share with others, it's considered it's called zakat. Every blessing. Now, one simple example, I have a time. Time is the blessing from Allah. I volunteer in the center. That time is called zakat. Now, I smile at a person, a mu'min. I smile at their face. That smile is considered sadaqah in Islam. And it's rewarded too. So in Islam, when I say zakat, it's not necessary. I have to give money. I have to give wealth. No. Some little things can be considered zakat too. And that is where the importance of Ahlul Bayt comes in the picture. One of the Imams who gave everything that he had was Imam al Hassan al Askin. This great Imam was born in the city of Medina. You know, most of the Imams, they were born in Medina. That's why Medina is known as the Medina is a city of Ahlul Bayt. Al-Imam al hassan al-Askari was born in Medina. His father is known as Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam. Al-Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam, not only is a father to Imam al hassan al-Askari, he was also a chosen father for Imam al hassan al-Askari. Every father of Ma'zum or Imam is a chosen. Now, sometimes people think it's too much. Well, why would he be chosen? Now, do you think your father did you choose him or Allah chose it for you? Our fathers, we didn't choose them. Allah chose them for that for us. Our mothers are chosen by Allah. You think the imams, their fathers, will not be chosen by Allah? Not everybody can be a father of ma'asum. For a father to become a ma'asum, they have to meet certain criteria. And that's why Allah told Rasulullah in the Quran, He said, وَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكْ أَلَّذِي يَرَاكَ حِينَ تَكُمْ وَتَقَلُّبَكَ فِي السَّاجِدِينَ Ya Rasulullah, we see you from one ancestor to another ancestor who happened to be all of them, they prostrate and the people of God. This, the lineage of Rasulullah from Adam up to his father, Abdullah, they all were chosen people. People who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every Imam is chosen to be an Imam, and every Imam's father is chosen too. Not only the father, the mother of every Imam is chosen too. Now, Imam al Hassan al Askari, his mother is known as Sausan or Sausan. That was the name of Imam al Hassan al Askari's mother, which is the wife of Imam al Hadi alayhi salam. And Imam al Hadi alayhi salam started his life. He opened his eyes in the city of Nabi, the greatest, second important city in Islam. And his father, Imam al Hadi alayhi salam, when he was born, some of the narration said Imam al Hadi, Imam al Hassan al Askari, was born in the state of sujood. He was born and he was in the state of sujood. Now his father, Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam, the first thing he did when he picked his son was to first call Adhan in the right ear. And that is one of the mustahabbat of every father. When you are blessed with a child, boy or girl, the first thing as a father you're supposed to do is to call Adhan in the ear, in the right ear. And Iqama in the left ear. And Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam, his father did exactly that. And Imam al-Hadi alayhi salam started to raise his son, Imam al-Asr al-Askari. But the first thing he did after the Adhan, 
was to name him Al Hasan. You know, this is one of the common repeated name among Ahlul Bayt. You know, Ahlul Bayt alayhi wasalam, all the 12 Imams, their names are repeated more and some of them only once. The most repeated names among Ahlul Bayt is Muhammad and Ali. For Muhammad and for Ali. Al Hasan alayhi salam was repeated twice. Now the rest of the names, which is Ja'far, for example, is one time. Musa is one time. But Imam Al Hasan was repeated twice. One is the second Imam alayhi salam, and the Imam 11, Imam Al Hasan al Askir. His name was driven from a special source. Now, according to the narrations, they say, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, was given the news that his daughter, Zahra, has given birth to a, to a boy, the first grandson, Imam al-Hasan alayhi wa and everybody was asking Rasulullah, what did you name your son? The Prophet says, I'm not going to name my son before Allah tells me what to do. Jabra'il came and said, Ya Rasulullah, Sammi Shabar. Shabar, the Prophet asked, What is the meaning of Shabar, Ya Jabra'il? He said, Ya Jabra'il, what does that mean? He said, Ya Rasulullah, Shabar is the name of the wasi of Prophet Musa alayhi salam. He had two sons also, one is called Shabar and Shubair. And Shabar means Hassan, beauty. So Ya Rasulullah, Sammi Hassan, name him Hassan. From that name, Imam al Hassan al Askari was named after his grandfather, Imam <coughs> Hassan. And Imam al-Hassan al-Askari has other names too. One of the famous names that is known of is al-Askari. Al-Askari, the reason why it's called al-Askari because Imam al-Hassan al-Askari was forced by the leaders or by the Bani al-Abbas, they forced Imam al-Hadi to migrate from Medina to Iraq against his will. Our Imams, they love to stay in Medina, close to Rasulullah. But the Bani Umayyah and Bani Abbas, they constantly forcing our Imams to migrate against their wall. And that is how they force Imam Al Hadi السلام, to move from Medina to Iraq. And when Imam moved to Iraq, they put him in the city called Mu'askar. Mu'askar, literally in Arabic, Meaning the city where the army camp is. An askar is an army camp. And they put Imam in that city so they can observe every movement of Imam. And Imam alayhi salam, even though he was under that restriction and under that watch, every step of his life, Imam did his responsibility. Nothing ever came in the life of Imam and let it go without doing his responsibility. Al Imam alayhi salam, even though he lived a very short life, even though his life was very short, not as long as other Imams, but in that very short time of his life, he did so much for Muslim and Islam. Many things Imam did. One of the things that Imam did, even though he was in prison, but he was raising leaders and great companions. How did he do that? Through letters that he write to his companions. Those letters that he write contains advice after advice to his companions and what to do. Many of the Imam al Asad al Asad his companion, they were became, they were able to reach to the higher level of knowledge through the teachings of Imam al Hasan al Asad through letters. Because Imam al Hasan al Askari during his lifetime, he was not allowed to give speech. He was not allowed to teach. He was not allowed to even meet people. So, for the most part, Imam alayhi salam, 
when his companions they have something they have a question they normally write as a question and hide it and give it to imam one way or another and when imam received that question he responds and give it back to his companions that was the life of imam al-hasan al that's one of his contribution to islam now the second contribution of imam was imam al-hasan al askari was the one who prepared the mu'mineen and shia for the arrival of imam al-hujja al jalallahu ta'ala wow. wow. you know al-imam al-hasan al askari during his time they were anticipating the birth of Imam Al Mahdi. But they anticipated to find him, recognize him, and kill him. Why? Because they know that Imam Al Hujjah is going to come and change the entire world and change the system. And they are not willing to do that. Similar to Pharaoh. When Pharaoh during his time, when they told him that there will be a boy that will be born. And that boy will come and take care of you, and he will come and take the power away from you. What did Pharaoh started to do in Quran mentioned? From that moment, Pharaoh started killing every boy born at that time to secure his kingdom. Taking that, when he does that, when he when he's, he's, if, if he's able to do that, he will secure his kingdom. But look at how Allah works. He killed the innocent children. And finally, the child that is going to come and overthrow him was raised by Pharaoh in his own house. He was trying to kill other children to protect himself. But finally, Allah brought that child in his house. And he was raising that child without him knowing this is the child that is going to overthrow my government and my power. The same thing Imam al-Hasan al askari during his time, he tried to prepare the Shia. How did he prepare them? Number one, Imam al Hassan al only had one child. That's it. Now, many of our Imams have many children. Now, like Imam Ali, السلام, like other Imams, they have children. But Imam al Hassan al only had one son. That's it. And that son is Imam al Hujjah. But prior to him having Imam al Hujjah, and Imam al Hassan al Askari, many people, including Shia, they were wondering if there will ever be a 12th Imam. And if it will be, where would he come from? How would that happen? Because they were looking left and right, and Imam al Hassan al Askari didn't have a child. Until some of them started to ask Imam al Hassan al Askari. Do we have Imam after you, or you are the last Imam? Imam says, of course there is Imam after you. And he said in one of the narrations, I said, even if the world is left with one day, one day left in the, in the world, Allah would have prolonged that one day until the 12th Imam come out to fill the world with the justice after the world is filled with injustice. That is Imam al-Hasan al preparing the minds and the heart of these people. And not only that, Imam al-Hasan al used to tell his companion, the best ibadah for you is to wait for the arrival of your Imam. Afdalul ibadah, intidharul faraj. Waiting for the appearance of Imam is the best act. Preparing the mind of people. And amazing how Imam al-Hassan al-Askari lived his life. Very short life, but full of lessons for all of us. And Imam al-Hassan al-Askari, one of the things that is known about him is one of the signs that we know from Imam is to know what we call Ilm al -ghayb. Now There are many people who question how can Imam know on scene? Now when you take the Quran, Allah clearly tells us there are many people who have ilm al -ghayb. Some of them are not even prophets, but Allah gave them ilm al -ghayb. Now we check in the Quran, in Surah Al-Kahf, Khidr, Allah talks about him. When Khidr was, was traveling with Musa السلام, and they saw a child and he killed the child. And they asked Khidr, why did you kill the child? 
He said, I can see this child. If he is to live longer and become adult, he will mislead his parents and he will take them to hell. And Allah want me to take his life and Allah will replace him with another child who will become a father of 70 prophets. How do you know all of that? Khadr alayhi salam, he was not a prophet, but he had the end of life. Not only the Quran tells you, when he and Musa boarded on that boat, Khadr started to make a hole. He said, because I can see there is a king waiting right up there to take every boat that is good. So to secure that boat, I have to make a hole so that he can leave that boat to the poor people so they can work with that boat to earn their living. That's Ilm al-Ghayn. Our Imam al-Hassan al-Askari and the rest of the Imams, they have some Ilm al -Ghayn. One of the Ilm al of Imam alayhi salam, he knew when was the time to get married and which woman should he marry and which woman should be a mother of Imam al hajj according to the narrations when the war of Romans came to an end and they captured some Romans they were bringing them as some of them as a slave to Iraq Imam was in Iraq but he has the information when are they going to arrive and where they will be arrived. He called one of his companions and he took some amount of money without even looking. And he told his companion, go to such and such place. There will be many slaves, male and female were brought and they're all for sale. You will see a woman, one of them. She is shy. She's had modesty. She doesn't look at the face of people. He said, go to her and tell her that you are sent by Imam al-Hassan al-Askir. And the moment you, she hears that, walk to the person who is in charge. Ask him how much this woman costs. When he tells you, don't even ask, just give him whatever is in the bag, and he or she will find the amount of the money that they ask him for. And surely enough, that's what happened. Imam al Hassan al Askari married his wife as they brought her, and she was the mother of Imam al Hujjah. This woman. When she came, she lived with Imam for a certain period of time and the Shia of Imam al Asad al-Askari kept asking, when are we going to have the next Imam? When are you going to have Imam? And nobody could tell. Imam told them, you have to be patient. The next Imam's time is in the hand of Allah. Until the time that she became pregnant, the day she's supposed to deliver the child, Imam al-Mahdi, Imam al Hassan al Askari called his aunt, called Hakima, to come and be in the house. When she came, she couldn't believe that the wife of Imam al Hassan al Askari is pregnant. When she looked at Imam al Hujjah's mother, she said, Ma alayha min alamat al -ham. I don't see any sign of pregnancy. Imam said, Yes, there is a sign of pregnancy. Today is the day that Allah promised that the 12th Imam must be born. Imam al Mahdi alayhi salam, the pregnancy was completely hidden. Because Allah knew that if the pregnancy was to be obvious, the enemies of Islam wouldn't let Imam to leave. And surely enough, five years after his birth, he had to go to Raiba. Because of those enemies. But Imam al Hassan al Askari alayhi salam lived in a time where there are so many atheists. And Imam al Hassan al Askari have to debate with many of them and prove them wrong and bring so many of them back to Islam. Many of it, Imam al Hassan al Askari was put into an argument or debate with some Christians, some Jews, and Imam al Hassan al Askari always proved them he is the grandson of Rasul. That is an Imam al Hassan al Askari. 
many occasions things happen. And Imam al Askari have to come and rescue Islam and Muslims with his knowledge. One incident, one of the companions of Imam al Hassan al Askari started to say he discovered there is contradiction in Quran. And he's going to write a book in that regarding that there is contradiction in Quran. Do you know one question from Imam al Hassan al Askari has ended? that notion and that thinking. When the news was spread in the city, that this alim is saying that he has come to find a contradiction in Quran. People started to doubt about Quran. People started to doubt about Islam. One of the companions of Imam al hasan al-Askari came to visit. Imam asked him, why don't you answer this man and stop him from writing a book regarding contradiction in Quran? Imam al Hassan al Askari, his companion responded, Who am I to respond to this great scholar? I don't have such knowledge to talk to him. I don't even have a knowledge to confront him. Imam al Hassan al Askari told him, Go and ask him one question and see if he can answer you that question. What was the question? Imam al Hassan told his, son, his companion, I said, Go and ask him that whatever he think he understood from the Quran and he thought is contradiction is there any possibility it was something different than what Allah meant and surely enough that one question was able to change his mind and get him to stop writing a book about the Quran today we have many school of thought that was created because of one misconception or one misunderstanding. Now imagine if Imam al Asr al-Askari didn't make that statement, that question. What would have happened today among the Muslim Ummah? We would have had some Muslims who believe, oh, there is contradiction in the Quran. Oh, Quran is not what we think. But with one question from Imam al Hassan al-Askari, he was able to put an end to that question and brought back Quran sanctity and Quran holiness. That was one of the contributions of Imam al Hassan al Askari. Not only that, at a time where many people were thirsty of learning Quran and knowing the tafsir of Quran, and there are many Mus Muslims. Who think who thought they know Quran and they can do Quran commentary? <laughs> Imam al Hassan al Askari was in prison and he wrote Tafsir al Quran. And today we have a Tafsir of Quran which is written by Imam al Hassan al Askari, an authentic Tafsir. All of this was one of the contribution of Imam al Hassan al Askari. Peace be upon him on the day he was born and peace be upon him on the day he will be resurrected we pray to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to count us among the true followers of this great imam ya rabbal alameen ya allah give us the tawfiq to visit the shrine of this great imam ya rabbal alameen ya allah we ask you yawm al qiyamah grant us the shafa' of imam al hasan al askari alayhi salam ya allah do not separate between us and our great imams ya rabbal alameen بالنبي وآل محمد صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد